So, telling stories that matter. So, I have always been a storyteller. So much so that my mother called me storyteller-in-chief. If anyone came to our house, uh, a neighbor, friend, relative, stranger, I would tell them a story, true or otherwise. And if there were no humans, I would just line up my teddy bears, stand in front of the teddy bears, and be storyteller-in-chief. Now, I'm a professional storyteller, and one of my titles is Storyteller-in-Residence. And I teach storytelling, and I tell stories in the theater, in education, at universities, and in business. They say that you need two things to be an expert. You need to come from somewhere else, Cambridge, and you need to have a PowerPoint. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So we all have stories to tell. And right now, I'm telling most of my stories uh, in my theater in Cambridge. And this is called the Cambridge Junction. And we call it the Cambridge Junction because it is where art meets life. And that's the junction. And at the theater, we tell stories that matter. We try and tell socially important, socially conscious stories that get people to think about their lives. And we often um, work in different genre. We either commission writers or we work with old plays that have very powerful stories for people to hear. And that's our process for commissioning and developing work. So when we do something like Chekhov's The Cherry Orchard, we make it a story that really has a universal truth. So this is a fictional work of a fictional family, but actually it has a universal truth. And as we tell this story on stage, each one of the audience members thinks about their life, about what they maybe um, will have to lose or to gain in the future. This family is going to lose a lot in the future as the world changes for them. So we tell stories on stage that have a universal power, metaphorically and fictionally. Okay, so they appeal to us. Now, recently, we had a different type of performance at our theatre, this production called The Summer Before Everything. Um, this was not a metaphorical storytelling, this was real storytelling, almost like documentary style, but on stage. And what we did was, in 2013, 2014, two of our writers went out to Ukraine, to Crimea and to Kyiv, and they interviewed people about the situation in 2014, when the Russians were coming into Crimea, there was Maidan, the pro-Russian government was being overthrown, and we saw this great struggle in, in um, Ukraine. And two of our writers interviewed people in Ukraine to find out what their real story was. And three of the um, people that um, interviewed, we then told their story on stage, verbatim style. Every single word that was spoken was spoken by these three people. And we did that performance in 2014. It was very powerful and interesting to hear people's stories live on stage. But of course, now we revived it this summer, and we revived this performance because the three people whose words that we had chosen to put on stage, their lives had changed dramatically. One of the people had been a doctor, and he's now the mayor of one of the towns that is severely under attack in Ukraine, and we got to hear his story then, and we get to hear his story now. One of the other um, people in the story, their real story is they've had to leave Ukraine and go to Poland with, to protect her family and children. And then this other woman, who in 2014 was one of the very first females to join the resistance, to hold a gun. And the exact lines that were spoken in the play were her exact words, and they were these. If you could have told me that I, a teacher, the most peaceful of all professions, if you could tell me that I would go to the border and hold a gun, it would be unthinkable it would be impossible that that would happen, but it did. That is real storytelling. In my other storytelling job, 
um, I work at the University of Cambridge. Now, this building is the business school where I teach uh, business with uh, master students. When you walk out of that university building onto Trumpington Street in Cambridge, this is directly opposite um, the university building, there's this really rather interesting trough in the road. It's perfect size for tourists to get their car tires stuck in. So it's quite a, most days you come and help somebody lift a car, a higher car out of the trough. But this trough is part of what was called Hobson's Conduit. And he was an entrepreneur who lived in Cambridge in the 16th century. And he completely transformed the story of Cambridge by bringing fresh water into the city. And it meant that the city was able to thrive. And on both sides of the street were these troughs that brought the fresh water into the city. And that was a practical element that completely changed the story of Cambridge. Now, you may recognize his name, because Hobson gave his name to a saying in English which is called Hobson's Choice. And Hobson's Choice means that you get what you're given, and you take it or you leave it. You only have one choice, and it's Hobson's choice. And this phrase came because he ran the first taxi service between Cambridge and London. He had a stable full of horses in Cambridge at St. Catherine's College, and you would go and you would hire a horse, and you would ride that horse down to London, and you would leave the horse in the stables in London, and then when you were ready, you would ride the horse back. Now, he realized fairly early on that if you just turned up and said, I want that horse, or I want that horse, it may not be the most rested horse. That horse could be just one that has only just come back from a journey. So he built a stables with numbers so that the horse that arrived went into the furthest stable, and the horse that was most rested would move forward until it was in stable number one. And that was called Hobson's Choice. When you turned up for a horse, you were given horse number one, no other choice. And the reason that it was so important, because the welfare of the horses was paramount to him, and he had that sort of what I call spiritual or values-based dynamic, which drove that story. So not only was he a practical man, he was also a spiritual man. And he knew that stories were driven not just by practical things, but by values as well. So whose stories are we telling? I'm telling the story of this amazing entrepreneur, but whose stories are we choosing to tell? And when we tell stories, we go back into the past to learn lessons for the future. So we can't ignore people like this that had a big impact on history. We have to learn lessons from their story to be able to understand stories of the future. And that's what stories are. We have the past, we have the present, we have the future. We think of a story as we enter into a world and we understand it, and then something happens. Something disrupts that world, changes that world, or we're given an opportunity or a surprise, and then we have the struggle, and then we have the new world. And that is what storytelling is. And sometimes those stories are evil stories or bad stories. We have to learn from them so they don't happen again in the future. We also celebrate, of course, uh, people in um, statues. You probably can see John Lennon's up there amongst all the other Johns. And it's, it's interesting who we decide to tell the story of in statues in the UK. And this is a very interesting fact. There are more statues in Britain named after men called John than there are to women. That is extraordinary, isn't it? Whose story are we choosing to, to tell? 80% of the statues in Great Britain are to men. Only 20% are to women. So we have to be able to tell a much more universal set of stories for people to be able to both celebrate and honor those people and understand the value of their stories, not just guys called John. Now, there's a program in America called Everybody Has a Story. It ran for a few years on CBS. And we go away from these celebrity stories. Uh, we go away from Eric the Peculiar or Harold the Hairy, and we come down to people who have, let's call them, ordinary stories. And the way this program worked was that the producers would get a map of America, and they would throw a dart onto this map, and it would land in a town or city. 
and then they would get a phone book, and then they would randomly choose any street name, and they would find it, and they would choose a person, and they would go and knock on the door and ask that person if they could tell their story on television. And sometimes the stories were very, very ordinary about someone who just lived a very stable and ordinary life, stayed in a home maybe, the same house all their life. But somehow, those stories were utterly fascinating, just about how they would live their lives. Two of the stories that were a little bit more dramatic um, in this series, one was about a fireman who had rescued somebody and then became lifelong friends and ended up living with that person that he'd rescued from a burning house, so lifelong friendship. But much more interesting than that was a story, and again, they just knocked on the door and said, can we hear your story? And the woman said, I don't have a story. And they talked to her a little bit more, and they realized that she had a really amazing story. So she worked at a school for children with disabilities, various different types of disabilities. And she was a helper at that school. And um, she had a son that was, her son was, would be described as normal, you know, as, as we would think of it. And rather than send her son to preschool to a normal school, she enrolled him into this school where all the other children had some type of disability. And the story was amazing because what happened to that young man was the first three years of his education were around people that were different to him, he had a sense of diversity, but also where his values had to be tested, where he had to engage with people who needed help, but also that could help him. And we start to see the story be driven by a spiritual sense of values. And that young man's life was very different. His story was because of what he learned in that school. So the third area of storytelling that I've been interested in have been around my values. And I've been working across the UK um, with uh, startups who are trying to fight climate change. Okay? And I've been trying to help them tell stories to be able to get investment and backing to fight climate change, particularly to take carbon out of the atmosphere. And this is a huge challenge, and we have to tell amazing stories. And I say to them, and as I say to you, what do you see in this world that everyone else sees but basically ignores. And this is Sisyphus, and every day he pushes the rock to the top of the hill, and every day he cannot get it to the top of the hill, and every day that rock rolls back down again. And unless we can change his behavior with practical, emotional, and spiritual help, by understanding the values that drive climate change to be able to make a difference, if we, unless we can do it, that rock will keep rolling down the hill. So, we try and tell stories for people to be able to change their behavior. Are we going to thrive? Are we going to survive? Or are we going to deprive future generations of this planet of which we live? Stories have credible facts in climate change. This July was one of the most, was the hottest July ever recorded. We have the numbers, we have the figures. We see percentages of icebergs melting. We see sea levels rising. We see all of the, right across the world, climate disasters. And we have the credible figures. And we can tell stories with credible figures. But there are also literally incredible things happening. This is from the American Scientific saying that there are only 60 years of viable farming left in the world because of soil degradation, only 60 years. Many of you in this room will live another 60 years, and the soil will not be, we will not be able to grow anything unless we do something about it. And that will be an innovation or attending to the soil upon which we walk. These are stories that have to be told. But what story do you want to create? We talked about that young man going into that special school. This is my daughter, Trudy. I'm very proud of her. She has a, she, she's studying at university social policy and enterprise. And she is determined that through understanding social policy and governments and understanding the nature of innovation and enterprise, that she can make a difference to the planet upon which she lives. That is a future story. Now, my personal circumstances changed a few years ago, and I needed somewhere to live. And I went around some of my friends, and I had a friend who said that I could go and live with her. 
And so I moved in um, and became her lodger. And she had a very interesting job. She was um, somebody who would do ceremonies at funerals. She was not religious, but she would do non-religious ceremonies. And essentially, she would help people to tell stories about loved ones that had just died. So I had this extraordinary kind of world where when I would come down uh, for coffee in the morning, she would tell me about the funeral that had been the day before. So when I was having my breakfast, I got to hear about a funeral, kind of an odd breakfast, but, uh, but nevertheless, I got to hear some really, truly fascinating and very, very moving stories. Stories about ordinary lives of somebody who'd lived 90 or 100 years. Really very difficult stories of a baby that maybe had died at birth, or somebody that had committed suicide, or died in prison. An extraordinary story that she told me one day of a young lady who was working in the city of London, seemingly successful, at a meeting in the middle of the day in a high building. The meeting ended. She got up and threw herself out of the window. And that was her funeral that had been the day before. And you wonder, what was her story? What happened to her? Now, she, she handed me um, one day a piece of paper, this piece of paper, and it had on it a reading that um, somebody had done at a funeral. And it was a famous um, poem. It was a poem by Maya Angelou. It's a very popular uh, poem for people to read. And, and I understood that people read these things at uh, funerals and that they divide up the funeral dynamic into two areas. There's a tribute, which are the credible facts of someone's life. The, the life is told through facts of, of, of how long they lived, where they lived, who they married, what their education was, what their job was. And that, that is the eulogy. Um, that, that's the, what you give as a eulogy. And then there's the tribute, something about someone that, that brings their story to life. Now, this, this was a poem that was read um, at a funeral that I listened to. Um, and she read this poem to me one morning. And I got really thinking about people's stories in life. So this is by Maya Angelou, and it's called I've Learned. And I'll read it the way that Helen, my friend, handed it to me. This was at someone's funeral. I've learned that no matter what happens or how bad it seems today, life goes on and it will be better tomorrow. I've learned that you can tell a lot about a person by the way that he or she handles these three things. A rainy day, lost luggage, or tangled Christmas tree lights. I've learned that regardless of your relationship to your parents, you will miss them when they're gone from your life. I've learned that making a living is not the same thing as making a life. I've learned that life sometimes gives you a second chance. I've learned that you shouldn't go through life with a catcher's mitt on both hands. You need to be able to throw some things back. I've learned that whenever I decide something with an open heart, I usually make the right decision. I've learned that even when I have pains, I don't have to be one. I've learned that every day you should reach out and touch someone People love a warm hug or just a friendly pat on the back. I've learned that I still have a lot to learn. I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did. But people will never forget how you made them feel. So that was read to me at breakfast. And I thought, wow, that's extraordinary. So. So I thought, well, I'm an expert, so I'd better make a PowerPoint out of that. Right, so, so here's life, <laughs> okay, here's the story, here's us, and here's how we tell our stories. We either thrive in our lives. Many people just survive their lives, and many people are deprived, and they have to fight for their life. There is a fuel of life. And this fuel is something that we give and something that we get. This fuel is emotional, the emotions that we share with people. This fuel is practical, the things that we give and the environment that we give to people. 
And these things are spiritual, the values that we instill in people. And at the end of our lives, we'll ha- there will be a eulogy. And it will say the credible things that we did. But there will also be a tribute. And that tribute will be about whether or not we truly made a difference and to who. Now, I'm no Maya Angelou. But let's be honest, I am a storyteller in chief. Yes, my mother said so. So I've, with all good grace, rewritten Maya's poem. And this would be my version right now. So it goes like this. Sorry, Maya. I've learned that no no matter what happens or how bad it seems today, life may not go on and it may not be better tomorrow unless we do something about it. I've learned you can tell a lot about a person by the way that he or she handles these three things. Tea without milk, impossible. Criticism, we're told so often that we are wrong. How do we handle criticism? And the climate emergency. I've learned that regardless of your relationship with your planet, you will miss it when it's gone from your life. I've learned that making a living is not the same thing as making a life. Yes. I've learned that life may not give you a second chance. There seems to be no second chances now. I've learned that you shouldn't go through life with a catcher's mitt on both hands. You need to be able to throw some things back. It's a bit American, but I quite like it. I couldn't think of anything better than a catcher's mitt, so I stuck with it. I've learned that whenever you decide something with an open heart and an open mind, you usually make the right decision. I've learned that even when I have pains, I don't have to be one, but I have to share my pain. I've learned that every day you should reach out and touch someone. People love a warm hug or just a friendly pat on the back, but not during a pandemic. (laughs) I've learned that I still have a lot to learn. I've learned that if you share your story, past, present, and future, if you share practical, emotional, and spiritual fuel, if you've shown how you have thrived and how you have survived, if you tell stories that matter with energy, head, heart, and soul, then I've learned that people will not forget what you've said. People will not forget what you did. And people will not forget how you made them feel. Thank you.